Good afternoon all and thank you for attending our inaugural meeting. Uh, my name is Chinwe Obinwa. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and clinical director of the Forensic and Rehabilitation Division of Derbyshire Healthcare Foundation Trust. I'm also the president of the Association of Black Psychiatrists UK. Bain covers a wide range of ethnic groups and cultural perspective, which translates to their different experiences of healthcare systems they work in. The Association of Black Psychiatrists in UK was born out of a need for a supportive platform to promote professional development of black psychiatrists and excellence in patient care. Our goal is to ensure that we support black psychiatrists to be the very best they can be, despite the challenges they may encounter in a health system that can sometimes be difficult to navigate. We believe it ultimately translates into better patient care. I'd like to invite you all to coalesce with our voices into one. Together, we can drive sustainable systemic changes. Without much further ado, I'd like to introduce our very first speaker, Mr. Paul Rees. He's the CEO of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Mr. Rees joined the Royal College of Psychiatrists as the Chief Executive in November 2016 from the Royal College of GPs, where he was the Executive Director of Policy and Engagement. Working closely with the honorary officers, Mr. Rees led the modernization of the college, leading to its transformation, stronger membership communication, more effective stakeholder engagement, and a dynamic employee relations strategy. In collaboration with the college officers, he led the introduction of a values based approach to the way the organization works, both its members and staff team based on its organizational values of courage, innovation, respect, collaboration, learning and excellence. And these were introduced in 2018. Amongst other things, this new approach saw the college celebrate Pride and Black History Month for the very first time in 2019 and the International Women's Day for the first time in 2020. This values-based approach led the college to being awarded Charity of the Year in the European Diversity Awards in 2019 and our own Paul Rees won the Louise Armstrong CEO Leadership Award. Mr. Paul Rees. Thank you very much, Chinua. It's having a few IT issues there, not able to unmute myself, but happily I now have. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Chinua. It's very kind of you. Um, and it's great to speak to everyone today. Um, if we could have the first slide up, it's the fantastic uh, logo, actually, of the Association of Black Psychiatrists. Um, and uh, it's really good to be here and addressing this inaugural event. And I would like, you know, as the Chief Executive of the Royal College of Psychiatrists to commend Chinway for setting up what is a very, very important organisation at a very important time uh, for black psychiatrists and black psychiatry. So thank you very much, Chinway. Now, um, everyone logging into this meeting will know just how important it is to have an association of black psychiatrists. There are, of course, many black psychiatrists in the workforce across the UK and beyond. In fact, of the RC Psych, 16,000 UK based members, around 1,000 of them are black and more than 300 a mixed race. But while there are black psychiatrists at every level of the workforce across the UK, they've not always been as celebrated or as visible as some other colleagues. And they've often faced barriers, hostility and rejection as was discovered by Agri Burke. Next slide, please. So I think we're going to see a slide of Agri Burke. There we go. So Agri Burke uh, was actually the first British black psychiatrist and Agri joined the workforce back in the 1970s. Now, as you may know, Agri shot to national prominence in 1986 when he published a paper that was picked up by the national media exposing the hidden practice of some medical schools whereby they kept up black and Asian students using the recruitment processes 
to weed out anyone with a name that indicated they were possibly black, Asian or minority ethnic. The media coverage generated by his research, which he carried out, as I say, in the mid 80s with a colleague of his, a, a black medical colleague, Joe Collier, led to a national debate about a, a colour bar at the UK's medical schools. But Agri's bravery came at a price, with the result that his role of consultant psychiatrist was diminished. However, since Agri first set foot in the workforce and since his groundbreaking research, many other black psychiatrists have joined the profession. And when the college recently unveiled its first ever set of values of courage, innovation, respect, collaboration, learning and excellence, we quickly decided that we needed to showcase under the value of respect, the great work of uh, black people who have contributed so much to the specialty. So last year, for the first time ever, having also celebrated Pride uh, last year and with plans to celebrate International Women's Day later on uh, in March 2020, last year in October, we launched our first ever Black History Month celebrations. And if we can have the next slide, please, and um, we'll see our banner. So that was the banner we produced uh, with the slogan, the RC Psych is proud to support Black History Month. Um, and it features a number of uh, prominent black psychiatrists alongside Agri. So they are RC Psych Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Professor Femi Oyabodi, um, Alpha Stewart, um, the first ever black president of the American Psychiatric Association, a former deputy director general of the World Health Organization, Professor Thomas Lambu, University of the West Indies lecturer, Professor Frederick Hickling, and Radio 4 presenter, newspaper columnist and lecturer, Professor Kwame McKenzie. We also ran a blog uh, this time last year on the college website by RC Psych Associate Registrar for Policy Support, Tim Ojo, in which he talked about the importance of Black History Month. And we ran quite a large and successful event on uh, black mental health. Then in January, Dr. Adrian James, who is actually the next speaker, won the election to become the next RC Psych president having made equality and diversity one of his top priorities. Now, I'll leave Adrian to talk in a few moments about our important work on equality at the college. But if we move to the next slide, um, just before Adrian took up post, um, we saw in Minneapolis the tragic murder of George Floyd. And of course, as we all know, this was an event that had reverberations around the world. Now, just a few days after George Floyd's death, the RC site became the first college to issue a statement condemning both his murder and all forms of racism. Now, our statement uh, was very well received by our members and one prominent member uh, who was actually a former presidential candidate, Rob Paul, Professor Rob Paul tweeted out that that statement has made 38 years of subscription fees worth it. We were also only one of two colleges to have our condemnation of George Floyd's murder featured prominently on our homepage. Now, four months after the publication of that statement, we've launched our second consecutive Black History Month celebration. On Thursday, the 15th of October, we hosted a free all member webinar entitled Careers in Psychiatry, Celebrating Black Psychiatrists. The webinar featured contributions from Dr. Lade Smith, who is one of Adrian's presidential leads for race equality, trainee psychiatrist, Dr. Julia, Ogun Mu Yiwa and medical student Olol Ade Obert Are. On our website and through social media this month, we've promoted blogs written by black psychiatrists. Uh, next slide, please. And we can see uh, from taken from the website there uh, a picture of on the right uh, consultant psychiatrist and founding member of Black Women in Health, Mosin Fapahunda, uh, and also uh, the uh, person who founded mental health charity Solutions, Celine Erio. Now next week on Thursday the 29th of October, we're running another free webinar for all members celebrating Black History Month in general, which features a stellar range of speakers, including Tim Ojo, uh, Lade Smith, Femi Oyabodi, Mosin Fapahunda, Agri Burke, and next slide please, Alpha Stewart. So in the lead up to October, we published the latest edition of our membership magazine, which is called RC Psych Insight. And if we can have the next slide, please, you'll see that on the cover, uh, we had a fantastic illustration 
drawn by black artists Kingsley and Betchy, who actually did a recent Google um, Doodle um, featuring a prominent uh, black person from uh, UK history, um, whose name is Ignatius Sancho. Now in the banner uh, uh, on the cover of uh, uh, RC Psych Insight, you can see Black Lives Matter features prominently and there's a nice montage of a, a, a various number of black people in various poses. And that really is putting uh, at the heart of our work, uh, the issue of the Black Lives Matter campaign and the importance of race and racism uh, within the UK society. And of course, is an issue for us to tackle as a college. Now at the RC site, we're proud to be one of the most diverse of the UK's medical royal colleges. We're proud that of our UK membership, 27% of our members are Asian, 6% of our members are black, and 2% of our members are mixed race. And if we look at the next slide, please, which I think is the last of my slides, you'll be glad to know, Ellen, we have uh, a picture of Dinesh Bugra, who was uh, one of the first minority ethnic presidents of any UK medical royal college. We're also proud that Agri Burke deservedly became an RC site president's medal winner earlier this year. And of course, I am very proud to have been appointed as the first black chief executive of any medical royal college uh, when I took up my post back in November 2016. So through our values and our work on equality, we've embarked upon a journey at the RC Psych through which we will be continuously celebrating black psychiatry, black psychiatrists and black history. As such, we are very proud to be supporting this inaugural meeting of the Association of Black Psychiatrists, and we hope to have a very close working relationship with the association over the coming weeks, uh, the coming months and the coming years. Thank you very much. Sorry, Chinwe, I think you might be on mute. Uh, thank you, Paul, for, uh, for the talk. And uh, yes, I must remember that. Um, if we could, uh, could just uh, a reminder uh, for all, if we could just keep our questions and then we'll take questions um, at the uh, at the end. Um, we've got the email address where you can send all your questions and uh, Paul will be happy to wait and take questions at the end. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Adrian James, uh, president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. He was elected president in 2020 and he's to hold this role until 2023. Dr. James is a consultant forensic psychiatrist at the Langdon Hospital in Devon. He was a former medical director of the Devon Partnership NHS Trust and founding chair of the School of Psychiatry in the Peninsula Deanery. In 2010, he was appointed Chair of the Westminster Parliamentary Liaison Committee of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So he attended the three main party <coughs> conferences in this capacity. He was Clinical Director for Mental Health, Dementia and Neurology, working with NHS England Southwest. He also acted as a reviewer and clinical expert for the Healthcare Commission and its successor organisation, the Care Quality Commission, best known as the CQC. Dr. James has chaired expert review groups on integrated care systems, cannabis, prevent and learning from deaths. In addition, he set up the Quality Improvement Committee and Workforce Wellbeing Committee at the college. His priorities as president are establishing a pathway to parity for mental health services, equality and diversity, sustainability and workforce wellbeing. Dr. Adrian James. Well, thanks uh, Chinui for that uh, introduction and thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here at the launch of the Association of Black Psychiatrists, particularly in Black History Month. And I want to thank you, Chinwei, for the work that you've done in setting up this organisation and for the leadership that's, uh, that's entailed. Uh, it does, however, fill me with great sadness that uh, this is the day 
after the tragic shootings in, in Lagos, where at least 12 people lost their lives. And our thoughts must be with the people of Nigeria um, and all the friends and family uh, uh, in the UK. Much of the inspiration for the, my, my involvement with um, inequalities uh, has come from uh, a talk that I, I went to uh, by David Williams, an academic from, from Harvard. And uh, he, he is an academic, he's published uh, widely, given lots of, uh, of talks on this issue. Many of you will have, have seen them. And he talks about the uh, wider inequalities being uh, in, uh, very important. Uh, social determinants of poor outcomes in a whole range of issues to do with uh, health, but uh, education, uh, the criminal justice system, that social determinants are uh, important. But racism is a, a key independent uh, factor. And he's done a huge amount of uh, research that demonstrates this. You all know that this is the case. But he also shows that, um, that uh, we're all worse off because of this, everybody, the, the whole of the, the, the community, and in our uh, um, uh, case, the, the community of psychiatrists, and more diverse organisations are better and have better outcomes. So this is obviously the right thing to do to concentrate on this, but it's actually about uh, a better organisation that performs better for our, um, our, our, our patients. And uh, the uh, the evidence based programs uh, do exist that can make a real, uh, real difference. And I'm very much aware that uh, key issues in addressing this are trust. Honesty, uh, experiencing pain and discomfort. Open dialogue, listening, but also uh, uh, hearing uh, what, what actually people are, being, are saying, but it's also acting and challenging. So this is a, a journey and today is a very important uh, step on that, uh, that journey. So I'm delighted to be with you. So if I move to my next slide. So this is uh, me, I'm the 47th president of the college. I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I still work clinically on a Monday and a Tuesday, uh, although I actually spend quite a bit of my time on the Monday and Tuesday in my clinical setting doing college work, but don't tell my employers. And I've got four uh, priorities, as has already been stated, and one of these uh, is, uh, is uh, around championing uh, diversity. Next slide. So uh, I think the, the ABP uh, uh, is, is a, a, such an important organisation. I'm delighted to support you and I, I want to have very strong uh, links uh, with you. And I uh, had a meeting with, with uh, Chinwe uh, last week. And the, the Black Lives Matter protests has revealed deep inequalities that uh, cut across society. These were uh, already there, as, as you all know, and uh, I don't think uh, any of us have done enough, uh, me in particular, to, 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 to identify these things and do something about it. The, uh, we, we want to um, it, look at improving representation as a key priority of my presidency, and the ABP will play a key role, I believe, in breaking down the barriers that uh, black and minority people face in entering and accessing support from the mental health profession. So next uh, slide. There are, uh, I've got a few, a few graphs here. Um, they, they, there's really one sort of key uh, uh, fact really, I guess, from, from each of them. This is a breakdown of the um, country of, of qualification. And I think the key factor here is that uh, less than half of uh, uh, consultant psychiatrists qualified in the UK. So uh, we uh, our, our engagement with the European Union and outside of the European Union is uh, is absolutely crucial. Uh, next slide. So in terms of uh, the, uh, the the uh, ethnicity of our members, uh, six percent of our members uh, are black, and it and there is wide variation. As you can see, the uh, um, uh, West Midlands uh, has the the um, is, is the, the 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 second highest. The highest proportion is the Eastern Division, but there is quite a a disparity in terms of our diversity. Next slide. 
but the real concern comes in terms of uh, the, the voice of black psychiatrists and uh, and their representation uh, within the, the college. So we have a real problem here. So in terms of uh, our committees, uh, only 2% of the uh, of our, our committee uh, uh, members are, are black. Next uh, slide. And in terms of our, our fellows, again, uh, the a, a lower proportion of our um, of, of black uh, members uh, become fellows. So we can see that we have a real issue here in terms of representation and uh, are supporting all our members uh, to be where they uh, where they want to be. Next, uh, next uh, slide. And in terms of medical students, Again, there's a real issue in terms of the underrepresentation uh, of uh, black uh, medical students uh, as compared to the general population. So we, we need to look at this issue uh, across the whole of the, the, the span of medicine. Next slide. So uh, I think the, the core values have already been uh, been covered, but I, I think they are really important. Uh, courage, innovation, respect, collaboration, learning and excellence. And I think Paul has done a fantastic job in embedding those values because it's very easy to say this is this is what what we, we do. These are our behaviours, these are our values. But uh, if, you, if you don't actually live uh, the values, then they're, they're pointless. They're just something written on uh, uh, a wall. Next uh, slide. So my uh, priorities are four equity between physical and uh, mental health, championing diversity, supporting the workforce, and putting sustainability at the heart of all we do. And though, although one of them, uh, uh, championing diversity, uh, is, is particularly focused on this issue, in fact, within all of these uh, um, priorities, there is uh, much to be done in terms of uh, valuing and pr promoting diversity. Uh, sustainability has a differential impact. Uh, in terms of supporting the workforce, we know that um, uh, some of our, our members from diverse backgrounds uh, don't get the support that they, they need. So there needs to be a particular uh, focus. And in terms of equity uh, between physical and, and mental health, the inequities are much greater in black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Next uh, slide. So in terms of uh, championing diversity, uh, we want to look at improving the outcomes from those with, uh, uh, with who have currently have the poorest outcomes, and uh, in terms of access to services, that uh, their access levels are lower, and that's because we don't provide services uh, that meet their needs and that people trust. So that's a we there's a big piece of work that needs to be done on that. There is no quality without equality, uh, and uh, we need to support staff. Uh, to address inequalities and to ensure that BAME staff uh, are supported to give of their best, but also to get any to anywhere within any organisation that they, they wish to get. Next uh, slide. So I'm uh, really delighted that uh, to have appointed two uh, presidential leads on race equality and uh, Lade is, is speaking uh, later on. So the two leads will feed into the college's equality strategy. We earlier on today, we had the overall uh, college strategy meeting, and this is one of the, the key uh, subjects. There was a lot of discussion today at the strategy day, and it's going to be uh, an absolute uh, priority. They'll also be uh, there to promote the recommendations in our position statement on racism and mental health and to advise council trustees and senior management on the effective options to take uh, our strategy forward. Next slide. So uh, early on uh, in the, the first wave of COVID, uh, we recognised that there was a, a real issue uh, in relation to the differential impact on black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, staff. And we set up a, a group chaired by Anand Darve, medical director in Lincolnshire, and she produced guidance on risk assessment and risk mitigation for all UK mental health services. 
this has been widely uh, praised and uh, widely implemented, not, not to the degree that we would wish it to be, and that we are speaking with people just to ensure that this is properly uh, embedded. I'd be uh, interested to hear of your experience of it. Next uh, slide. So in terms of our commitment, uh, we at the college recognise the, the hurt felt by black, Asian and minority ethnic people in the profession, and we're committed to uh, supporting black, Asian and minority ethnic psychiatrists to give their best, enable black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, psychiatrists to access leadership roles within the college and to ensure that uh, psychiatry is an open and welcoming profession for all. Next slide. So uh, that's questions. I think we've got a questions uh, session later on and obviously I'll be uh, with you for the whole of the uh, uh, presentation. So thank you for inviting me and uh, I look forward to working very closely over the next three years of my presidency. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Um, please keep your questions coming. Um, of questions to go to um, Dr. Hal at online hal at um, gmail.com. Without much further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Shobaladi Smith. Dr. Smith is a consultant psychiatrist at the South London and Maudsley. NHS Foundation Trust. She's also a visiting senior lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, King's College London. Dr. Smith graduated in medicine from Guy's Hospital Medical School in London, winning lots of prizes in psychological medicine. After her training, in psychiatry at the Maudsley, she completed a research fellowship in antipsychotic side effects, supervised by the Professor Sir Robin Murray. She subsequently set up a one stop shop where uh, you, there was a joint medication review and physical health clinic aimed at health promotion and management of physical health problems in people with severe mental illness. This led her to be nominated as Woman of the Year and the BMA Pioneer Award for Innovation in Psychiatry. Having trained in general psychiatry, Dr. Smith is now a forensic psychiatrist. She is the lead for the Acute Forensic Pathway of South London Partnership and the Clinical Director of Forensic Services at South London and Maudsley Trust. She's also the clinical director of the National Collaborating Centre for Mental Health at the Royal College of Psychiatrists, providing medical leadership for the team developing mental health guidelines. <coughs> Dr. Smith sat on the core working group of the Independent Mental Health Act Review, chaired by Professor Simon Professor Sir Simon Wesley, and she was responsible for some of the key recommendation, including those for patients with forensic problems. Recommendations aimed at improving outcomes for black people with mental health problems have now been taken up by the government. Dr. Smith was awarded a CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours in June 2019 for services to forensic intensive care psychiatric services. In November 2019, she was awarded Psychiatrist of the Year by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Laddie Smith. Hi, so Junior, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak. Um, although I have to say that the title you gave me was uh, a bit chunky. So I've been asked to speak about race, the race equality agenda and what it means for the black jobbing psychiatrist working on the front line. So um, that's something that is, you know, just doesn't quite trip off the tongue very easily. That's not me, by the way, that's somebody else. <laughs> anyway, but 
Um, what I am going to tell you a little bit about is the work that uh, myself and my colleague Raj Mohan, uh, who is the other person working, who's been appointed as a race and equality lead for the college. And, and you can tell you a bit about what we're doing. Um, and I'm just going to remind you why we're doing what we're doing. So essentially, if you are a black person living in the UK, you unfortunately are much more likely to have a high rate of uh, fairly negative socioeconomic factors that impact on your health. As Adrian mentioned, this is something that David Williams has found. So we um, we know that um, black people, like as with other B um, BME people, have poor housing, poor access to educational opportunities, high levels of unemployment. Although, interestingly, you shouldn't lump people together because we know that um, if you are uh, um, black African, you actually have slightly higher um, higher rates than if you're black Caribbean. Interestingly, if you're South Asian of Indian descent, uh, you have 76% to 77% employment rates, which is equivalent to, to the white British population. If you are Pakistani or Bangladeshi, however, you only have 57% rates of employment, which is actually the worst out of all groups. But essentially, um, if you're black, you're more likely to be living in poverty, you're more likely to have poorer health outcomes, and that's in terms of your mental and physical health. And we know certainly that for black people, um, people of African and Caribbean heritage are 40% more likely than white British people to come into contact with mental health services through the criminal justice system rather than through the GP or through IAP services, which is what everyone else does. That's IAP, that's improving access to psychological therapy. We know that um, black people are more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act. And if you're black Caribbean origin, then you are more likely to be readmitted again under the Mental Health Act. And black people are more, much more likely to be overrepresented in locked wards, psychiatric intensive care and secure care have lo and have longer inpatient stays. And importantly, far less likely to receive psychological therapy. And if you do manage to get into psychological therapy, then you're much more likely to, to end up end your sessions abruptly earlier than they should be um, ended. People have said this is to do with uh, discrimination and uh, people people have postulated all sorts of all sorts of things, but we do know for sure that discrimination is associated with a higher rate of mental health problems. Stephanie Hatch's work has shown us that um, um, black, Asian, and minority ethnic people uh, are have two, to, especially black people, have two to four fold increased rates for common mental disorders like anxiety and depression. And there's increasing evidence, there's a nice study recently um, done by Pierce et al, showing that uh, um, when you remove all the, um, you know, actually there's a Johnson study showing you remove all the, so the social, you, you know, control for social factors and, uh, you know, then you eliminate quite a lot of the excess, um, the excess rates of psychosis that you see, but there's something left hanging over. And then the Pierce study showed that, guess what? there's a higher rate of, uh, there's a, an association between perceived discrimination and racism and the develop, subsequent development of psychosis. So David Williams, who was mentioned by, um, by Adrian, said that, uh, essentially saying that multiple aspects of racism relate to each other and they combine additively and interactively with other psychosocial risks and that affects people's overall health. And that seems to be what we're seeing. But that societal stuff's really important because there's an idea that somehow the societal effects are, are randomly distributed and, or, or it's because, you know, you, as an individual, something about you as an individual or your family, that means that you're, you're just not very good at getting on in life. You don't have much wherewithal. But there is evidence that, that higher levels of poverty and discrimination actually arise from long-term historical processes that tend to, in a systematic way, and, and this doesn't mean to say it's a deliberate way, or, and people are very conscious of it, but it's something that's been going on for such a long time that it's just part and part of the way in which we exist in our society. And that unfortunately creates barriers to education and economic opportunities and therefore wealth and upward mobility for certain groups of people. And uh, black people are one of those groups. 
Unfortunately, the historical processes include the embedding of negative stereotypes into the prevailing culture, as though these were true, inherent, immutable traits that are common to a particular ethnic group. And um, but if you're a black doctor, then you kind of think, well, surely that is something that will protect you from these negative stereotypes and you know how many people how many people here are parents if they're if they're you know 22 year old comes home from university and they bring home their new boyfriend or girlfriend or partner or whatever and they say oh yeah um he she they is a medical student and they're going to be a doctor we'll all be like yes results because being a doctor is generally something thought of as being rather good because it's likely that you'll have a job for life you won't have a problem with employment, you'll be fairly affluent, um, you'll be very well thought of, it's a high status position. But if you are black and a doctor, we know that you are, and this is all doctors, and actually not just black doctors, but BAME doctors, um, less likely to be in a senior position. It's likely that you're going to receive lower pay, you're more likely to fail your exams, and ominously, you are more likely to be referred to the GMC. And that is especially the case if you were trained overseas. Now we've heard about, um, I mean, I have to say psychiatry is one of the most diverse professions in the country. And, um, you know, nearly 40% of psychiatrists are from BME backgrounds. As Adrian said, we've about 6% are black, but even in within that, the majority of psychiatrists are actually from African backgrounds, particularly Nigerian backgrounds, which is probably relates to the, the, the populous, the, you know, the fact is that Nigeria is a very populous country. But there are very few Caribbean, uh, psychiatrists of Caribbean origin. And as Adrian mentioned, as you go through, as you go up, we find that there are, uh, you know, you've got about 6% of psychiatrists generally are, um, are black, but then you look at the fellows and it's less than about 2%. Just to make a note that that compares with about three or four percent of the general population being black. So actually in psychiatry doing pretty well, except when you look at the fact that the clinical population is actually about nine or ten percent and possibly more because the stats aren't kept very well. What does it mean if you are a black psychiatrist? What it means is that actually being a black doctor, it, it, it doesn't protect you from being subjected to the negative stereotypes. Look at Chinwe, she looks fantastic. She looks, she's so well turned out. She's clearly, uh, you know, wearing quite nice clothes. I'm sure they, they're not cheap clothes. Even if Chinwe walks into um, a shop, it's much more likely that because she's black, that the um, security guard's gonna be clocking her to see if she's gonna nick something rather than anybody else. That translates into other areas of our lives in terms of our work, etc. Your ethnic minority status, your blackness will result in your competence being called into question. Does it always happen? No, but it does happen often enough for it to be irritating. These unconscious biases unfortunately impact the decisions that people make about black doctors. So, what is the race equality agenda? The race equality agenda is to try and address some of those unfortunate inherent and unconscious biases that exist that may contribute to the differential attainment and the different different experiences of being a black doctor in the UK in particular black psychiatrist remember equality is when everyone's treated the same and that and underlies underpinning that assumption is that everyone is going to benefit from being given the same support Equity is when you give people the support they need to thrive. That doesn't just mean that, oh, you're black, you're brown, therefore we're going to give you a better job. That's not what we're talking about here, because actually there was, you know, frankly, there are plenty of black and brown people who don't need that additional support. But there are people who need extra supports because there have been barriers uh, stopping them from achieving their potential. And when you are able to do that, then you may well find that your workforce is happier, more productive, your um, treatments are more effective, and frankly, um, things will be a lot cheaper all around. 
the work that we're um, actually Billy Boland said said something. Billy Boland is the chair of the general adult faculty of the Royal College of Psychiatry, and he suggested that there needs to be safe space to recognise invisible barriers that can impede an individual's progress. And to do that, you need to have better understanding and recognition of those barriers that exist. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is actually talking to, you know, we've, we've suggested that there needs to be a bit more consultation, more meaningful consultation with the um, with the members. And what happens with the members is that we do a survey each year. Sometimes there's quite a lot of people who answer who have BAME backgrounds, but not always. So what we need, and this is a call out to all of you, please, please, please respond to those surveys. We're going to make sure that some of the questions on there are more meaningful. And some of you will have seen recently that there was a survey sent out. In addition, we're going to be asking people, how do you want to be, um, you know, how do you want to tell us what's been going on? So it might be focus groups, but it's going to be a bit of consultation at the beginning of the year to help understand a bit better what the factors are that people are finding are finding are impeding them from progressing. Of course, the college influences members directly and indirectly uh, through training and curriculum and exams and standard setting for your individual practice and also your mental health service that you're working, but also indirectly because as psychiatrists, we're all trained to the standards set by the college and then we go on to deliver this mental health care in a variety of settings. We're the leaders in teams and so we really strongly influence how mental health care is delivered. So what the college is going to do is actually look at the, how the college supports its members to, to thrive and to flourish. And, and we're going to try and make sure that we reduce any barriers there might be that are not related to your ability as a psychiatrist. There's going to be a review of the core and higher training curriculum uh, and to make sure it, it, that they adequately you know, reflect the knowledge and the skills required to deliver care that's equitable for everybody. And that means understanding any structural inequalities, and any power differentials. It's going to we're going to think about the exams and what might happen in the exams. I, I learned today that apparently, as you know, there's differential attainment for BAME people. And I learned today that the digitisation of the exams, which was done at phenomenal speed and incredible, with incredible, incredible, it managed to do it, has actually it seems to be associated with a reduction in that differentiation. It's early days, so who knows? But there needs to be more innovative approaches to try and reducing that differential attainment. So we want to hear from people. There's going to be um, work around. You may have heard of a thing called uh, the Advancing Mental Health Equality resource that was uh, put out by the NHS England and it was um, launched last week and there's going to be um, some work done to promote that across mental health services which will have an impact on on your work and the way in which you work and uh, and that also goes along hand in hand with a thing called the patient care and race equality framework again another initiative that um, that will be will be uh, suggested and supported which will help you to deliver better care to your patients. We're going to work with the CCQI around core standards for mental health services. So, and the hope is that they will then, through you actually, start to deliver more, more equitable access experience and outcomes for patients and carers. And we're going to be supporting regulatory bodies such as the CQC to ensure that their inspections include measures of equitable outcomes. And um, what we're going to be doing more than anything is trying to understand what the needs of psychiatrists are so that there will be so that you are less likely as a black doctor to be referred to the GMC. We're hoping to do review to review um, the criteria, review what criteria there are that actually means that people are much more likely to progress and those people who aren't. We're going to look at the kind of work that the GMC have done in their first, re first to refer report. We're going to look at, um, we're going to think, um, make some suggestions about how people get appointed. And once you've been appointed, how do you progress within your work? And what we're essentially thinking about is trying to, all these people who are very successful at their jobs, what happens to them? And try and imbue those skills and those competences in everybody else and that in particular in the black doctor so that if you have the potential you'll be able to do just as well as your work white counterparts so in your day-to-day -day work what it will mean is that people are going to start asking you how you feel 
they'll be more mindful about you and think about you in terms of what your needs might be. People are more likely to listen if you have a concern and people are more likely to actually implement and enact any of any of the suggestions that you put forward. So in your day to day work, you won't see a massive difference now, but in the next year or two, and certainly I hope in the next five years or so, you'll be able to say that actually there isn't that much differential attainment and you have just as good an experience as a black doctor as your white counterparts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. That was, uh, that was, uh, that was you know, giving us the food for thought there. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kareen Glover. Um, Dr. Glover was born in the Bronx, New York and raised, um, was born and raised in New York and she's spent a greater part of her life following and chasing her interests in science, health and improving the life of the un, um, underprivileged. Following her graduation from Howard University with a degree in history, she worked for Essence magazine and an account executive for Verizon. She then followed her curiosity about medicine and attended the Sunny Downstate College of Medicine and later obtained a Master's in Public Health from Columbia University following a very highly competitive Macy Scholars Programme. She's currently an Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine where Dr Glover teaches psychopharmacology and aspects of psychotherapy to internal medicine and family medicine residents. She's a consulting psychiatrist in primary care division of the Montefiore, hope I'm pronouncing that right, health system. In this position, she's a member of a system-wide collaborative care-based program where they provide direct psychiatric care to medically and psychosocially complex individuals living in the Bronx. Dr. Glover has authored a peer review article on mental disorders in primary care. She's also contributed to a textbook on psychiatric treatment in primary care and has extensive experience in psychopharmacology and substance disorder treatment. Dr. Glover has also contributed to various media outlets on a range of topics related to mental health and wellness. She uses mindfulness-based techniques in her psychiatric practice, in her career coaching professionals from marginalized cultures, and in her leadership of discussion of the impact of racism on physical and mental health. Dr. Kareem Glover. Thank you so much, Dr. Chinwe. I am so absolutely delighted to be here and I hope that over the next 15 minutes that I can share with you some words that will um, inspire and give comfort. We are going through quite a time here in the United States and world. our society is going through major changes. So I am so happy to be in contact with you and, and hope that this is the beginning of a very, very fruitful relationship. So I bring you all greetings from the Bronx, where I am in clinic. Uh, doing televisits with my patients. Uh, I'm also next to, I'm in family medicine clinic, so you may hear some children screaming because they're getting vaccines today. So in any event, just know that we're not torturing small children uh, except to give them vaccines, okay? So just to give everybody a sense of, of who I am, I am a black woman. I am the daughter of uh, a mother and father who were born and raised in Harlem, New York, here in this city. And I am the grandchild of people with a third or fourth grade education who were farmers from South Carolina. My mother's side of the family is Gullah or Geechee. That means that they are culturally descended from Africans who were enslaved, usually from the Sierra Leone region of West Africa. They are rice growers 
And so I grew up eating my grandmother's food and listening to her dialect, which contained lots of Africanisms. I never knew that when my grandmother was making red rice that she was actually making jollof. I don't know that she knew that she was making jollof, um, but I knew that she had a specific way of cooking that was different from any of my other friends. And it was when I went to West Africa at the age of 11 and I tried jollof that I said, I looked at my mother and I said, this is like grandma's food. And she said, where do you think we come from? So with that, I, 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 I want you to know that uh, part of my excitement over this um, meeting today is, is a continuation of how I was raised and, and who I am and the kind of work that I hope I'm doing on a regular basis. So I work in collaborative care and my desire is to make it easy for all kinds of people. I work in the poorest congressional district in the United States and our work here is to make it easy for the people who uh, Dr. Smith just talked about, the folks who are on the receiving end of the brunt of all of our social inequities here in, in our community, the people who are immigrants. This neighborhood has immigrants from Ghana, from Nigeria, from Senegal, from Cote d'Ivoire, from Gambia. And we are constantly working to make sure that when they are dealing with the social determinants of mental health and physical health, that their mental and physical needs can be assessed and treated here in primary care. So we want to make it easy for healing to occur. I want to, to stress that I got here not only through the blessings of my parents and the sacrifices of my grandparents, I want to also make it clear that along the way, I have been blessed to come into contact with amazing psychiatrists. And, and I think I want uh, people to know that I came into being an adult psychiatrist through knowing Alpha Stewart, through receiving her good words, through talking with Dr. Anel Prim from the American Psychiatric Association, through Chester Pierce, who was the, the Harvard educator, psychiatrist, and consultant for the the origins of uh, and the inspire one of the inspiring people behind Sesame Street. So, as a child, I watched Sesame Street and had no idea that a black man was one of the people dedicated to producing such a show. That he had the vision to know to 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 think to himself. Well, if we are building a new society during the '60s, right when there was also lots of upheaval, just like there is now. If we are building a new society, why don't we make sure that all children have access to something regarding making them good global citizens? And so this man worked with a team of men and women for our public broadcasting system to create this long lasting, futuristic, amazingly grounded and groundbreaking television show that could provide access to education to children around the world. So part of, part of I think one of the amazing parts of being black in a society where you are in the minority is that it gives you an outlier status, right? You, you walk the, this bridge between multiple cultures and that gives us an interesting perspective. It gives us sort of a, some exposure to trauma, of course, but in the process of understanding that trauma as psychiatrists, it also gives us language that perhaps other people don't have access to. And with that language, we have access to means and resources that perhaps other people need very badly. So I want us to, to constantly be aware of the, the privilege and the power and the ability to think in terms of the future and our creativity. One of the things I learned from, Chester, from the, the example of Chester Pierce and his work on microaggressions and Carl Bell and his discussions of microaggressions and Dr. Stewart and Dr. Prim was that when you're in the room with systems and people who uh, are at the helm, it's your job to speak up. I know that there were times when 
talking about Black Lives Matter meant that you would be stigmatized. There was a time when I was afraid to use those terms. And yet, it's amazing how times have changed. And so I understand that um, we are in a position to constantly move the needle forward. And as we bridge our multiple cultures and multiple backgrounds, I'm hoping that we constantly move with an eye towards our liberation and what that means and understanding the role of colonialism and discrimination in our mental health, figuring out what we owe to the motherland, to Africa, to our local communities and to the communities of the future. I wanna end by posing a series of questions essentially. I want us to think in terms of what we owe, what we owe Africa, what we owe our own communities, like I said, what we have to do to be safe and keep our communities safe from harm, and keeping in mind what we say and don't say in order to keep the agents of white supremacy comfortable. I want us to keep in mind what the music, what the sound of liberation is these days knowing that our brothers and sisters across the continent are facing multiple uh, levels of oppression and knowing that there is a soundtrack and an aesthetic for our freedom, listening for it, encouraging it, and figuring out how we in the diaspora can continue to work together as we blaze new trails for making mentoring easy for grade school children, for college age children, for non-traditional students. I worked in corporate America before I became a physician. And even thinking in terms of how we work with traditional healers, thinking in terms of how some of those folks have a lifeline through our community and that working with them is sometimes the key. We may not always meet on the same, uh, same principles, but there is room for, for work with each other. And so I want to, to end by saying that I so appreciate this opportunity. I want you to know that it, part of my inspiration it can, comes routinely through listening to the, the sounds of the diaspora. I was in, on vacation years ago in the Caribbean and they were, I was on a boat ride. They were playing Afrobeat. So they were playing music from Nigeria. I was singing along. A Jamaican woman on the boat turned to me and said, how do you know this? And I said, don't we all know this? And she said, I just thought, I just thought it was us. No, it's never just you. It's never just me. It's all of us. So I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. And I look forward to so much more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kareem. Uh, I can tell you we would have a lot to talk about, especially since you mentioned jollof rice. Now that is a conversation we're going to take outside here. Down there, uh, I would like to mention our last but not least speaker, Professor Femi Oyebode. Professor Oyebode was born in Lagos. He studied medicine at the University of Ibadan. Uh, graduating with distinction in 1977. He completed his health job at the University College Hospital Ibadan and worked at the Neuropsychiatric Hospital Aro, Abiokuta, for one year before coming to the UK in 1979. He trained as a psychiatrist in Newcastle upon Tyne. He was appointed consultant in Birmingham in 1986 and professor in 1999. He has been Medical Director of South Birmingham Mental Health Trust, Chief Examiner, Royal College of Psychiatry, Head of Department of Psychiatry, University of Birmingham, and he's an Honorary Professor of the Department of African Studies and Anthropology, University of Birmingham. Professor Yebode is the author of Sims, uh, Symptoms in the Mind, 46th edition, uh, I'm sure most of us own this book, the leading English language textbook on descriptive psychopathology. It's been translated into Estonian, Italian, Korean, Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Yevode.
Thank, thank you very much, Jinwei. I, I hope that uh, you can hear me because the um, it, it sounds to me as if the Wi-Fi is a, a little bit unstable. But I'm very, very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to be uh, involved in the inaugural meeting of the Association of Black Psychiatrists in the UK. And I, I need to say at the outset, uh, essentially a little bit like uh, Adrian did, that as a Nigerian, uh, barely 24 hours after a number of our people were killed, uh, defenseless young people, um, I, I'm a little bit fragile, emotionally fragile at present. So, so forgive me if, uh, um, if I'm not my usual kind of ebullient self when I'm speaking. My, my topic is to speak about, um, to talk about the past, the present and the future. But it is, uh, it is Black History Month and, um, and I'm going to focus essentially on the past because the idea of the Black History Month is, is to celebrate um, the contribution of people whose contributions have been covered over or glossed over. So, so I, my, I, my, I have a great desire just to, to, to talk a little bit about people who uh, you may not know very much about already. So, for example, I want to start off with uh, uh, Solomon Carter Fuller, who was born in 1872 in Monrovia, Liberia, and died in 1953. And he was educated in Monrovia and then went to America to study medicine and graduated at the Boston University in 1897. And he trained at Boston University as a psychiatrist and, and worked in the United States uh, between 1897 and 1901. And then he, he found that his progress was limited because of, because of the business of, uh, of segregation and the uh, embedded structural racism that was uh, rampant in the United States at the time. So he, in order to further his studies, he went to Munich to, to study for a year between 19, 1904 and 1905. And in Munich, to my great surprise, I discovered that he worked closely with Emil Kraepelin, with uh, Alois uh, Alzheimer, Otto von Bollinger and Hans Schmanns and, and then returned to America and practiced for 45 years as a clinical psychiatrist and as well as a neuropathologist for 22 years. He's better known for his contributions to uh, further our understanding of the neuropathology of, of Alzheimer's, what we now call Alzheimer's disease and he retired as Professor Emeritus of Boston University in 1937. So, and I, I say that because for, for, for those of us who are, are born on the continent of Africa and who grew up in Africa, we tend to think of other people as having made contributions to, to psychiatry. And we are, we are not properly aware of the fact that, uh, that uh, a person like Carter Fuller, who was born in Monrovia, had, had made a contribution of the kind that he has. And then I want to say briefly, uh, another talk briefly about another person, Curtis Crispin Adeniu Jones, who was born in, in Freetown, born in Wellington, Freetown in 1876 and died in 1957. And, and uh, it gives me an opportunity to, when, when I talk about uh, uh, Crispin uh, Adeniu Jones, gives me an opportunity to say how extraordinary uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone was and still is and how there was a confluence of, of all these different people, uh, black British people who returned to Africa, uh, people who were emancipated in the new world, who chose to come back to Africa from the Caribbean uh, and from Cuba and, 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 and from Portugal. And then those people who were still on slave, slave ships, who were right where the slave ships were stopped mid-Atlantic by the Royal Navy and returned to Freetown. And then the most important of this group, the people who had fought on the side of the British in, in the civil American War of Independence and when the British lost, who had then uh, uh, returned, moved, retreated with the British Army into Nova Scotia and then decided to come back to Africa. So, so Freetown is a, an amazing, amazing uh, town. Uh, with all this different conf conf confluence and, and the fact that these people then went on to make incredible contributions along the West African, West African coast. So Adenio Jones uh, has studied in, in, in Durham and, uh, and then worked, did his house jobs in Dublin and then returned to Lagos in 1904 
And I mention him because his contribution is far outside psychiatry, far outside medicine. So he was the first medical superintendent of the Yaba Asylum, and where, where he took over in 1904 and uh, worked in it until 1914 when he went into private practice. He, he never fully trained as a psychiatrist, but he was a physician who uh, helped to set up the asylum in Lagos. And then, and then there's a, a, another amazing fellow, uh, Tijani El Mahi, who was born in 19, 1911 and, and died in 1970. And, and if he hadn't died before the Royal College of Psychiatrists was set up, he would have been a founding fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And he was born in El Kawa, in the White Nile province, and, and graduated in 1935 from the Kitchener College of Medicine in Khartoum which was itself uh, uh, set up in 1900. And he trained at Maudsley and was awarded his DPM, the Diploma in Psychological Medicine in 1949. And, and he then returned home to Khartoum and founded the, the Clinic for Nervous Disorders in Khartoum and worked for the WHO from 1959 to 1964. And, and then of, because of his influence outside of medicine, out of psychiatry, he was on the Supreme Council of State in the Sudan from 1964 to, to, to his death. And he was professor of psychiatry in Khartoum. And, but what one of the amazing things about him was he was uh, 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 one of these individuals with uh, uh, massively gifted across the board. So he was a multilinguist. Uh, he, spoke, he spoke Latin, uh, uh, Sudanese Arabic, classical Arabic, English, Persian, and to my surprise, he also spoke Hausa, which is an important major language in uh, uh, in, in Nigeria. And he, he, at his death, his personal library, which was then given to the University of, of Khartoum, had 19,000, uh, uh, which included uh, uh, 6,000 documents, 2,000 letters going straight back to Alexander the Great. So quite a remarkable, uh, a remarkable individual. And the last, the last two people I want to talk about, who I usually talk about them, um, is is uh, Franz Fanon, and, and I'd like to bring it to our attention. Of course, most people know about Franz Fanon, but they know of him as a political theorist, and very few people make the connection that he was a psychiatrist. And and and, and it's also an, another important person to mention because, of course, is a is a psychiatrist who is uh, 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 who was born in the Caribbean. So he was born in Martinique to a middle-class family and his father was a customs agent and his mother was a shopkeeper. And he went to Lyon to study medicine and trained as a psychiatrist in Lyon and then moved to work in, in Algeria. So he was the first chief of, stir, chief of service in Blida Johnville Hospital in Algeria. And so I hope you can still hear me. And um, and he, he 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 his contributions seem in today's world very ordinary, because of course we 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 in Europe we think of the fact that the mentally ill people were unchained in the 19th century. But when when uh, Franz Fanon landed in Blida, the patients were still were still in chains. So he unchained the patients. He introduced a therapeutic community meetings. He introduced a social meeting. He understood the need for occupational therapy. He understood the need to have a culturally sensitive occupational therapy. So those his contributions outside of his politics are certainly worthy of, of, of comment and, and of study. And, and finally, uh, uh, to talk about uh, our own, I speak now as a Nigerian, our own uh, Thomas Adio Lambo, who was born in 1923, died in 2004, born and educated in Abeokuta, attended the Baptist High School in Lagos. And, and again, it's important to say something about where Adeo Ilambo was born. So he was born in Abeokuta, and Abeokuta was a transitory town where the people who were in Freetown, who knew they were Yoruba people, that was the gateway into what we now call Nigeria. And the first medical school in Nigeria was set up in Abeokuta in 1861 and, and uh, unfortunately failed for all sorts of compli complicated reasons, only lasted, only lasted until 1864. But the students who, re who, were, who were registered at the medical school in Abeokuta, all of them went on to King's College London to study and to graduate and then to return to work in, in Nigeria.
So, so, so the town where Adil Yilambo was born is important because of its influence on, on, on the modern, what you might call a modern Nigeria. It, it's influence in terms of the, the professions, not just in medicine, but of course also in, in, in the law. And, and a number of people who are famous and well known in Nigeria, Nathaniel King, who studied at King's College, uh, graduated in 1874, Obadiah Johnson, who graduated in King's College in 1888, and, 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 uh, and a number of others like that came out of that experience of, of Abelkuta. Now, what we want to say something about, uh, about Lambo. So you're, you've got Lambo, who uh, had a, a hospital which he built in Aru Abelkuta, where I worked for a year myself. He went on to be professor of psychiatry in Ibadan, became the first psychiatrist who was the dean of the medical school in Ibadan, and then went on to be the vice chancellor of the university before moving to the WHO, where he rose to be deputy d director of the WHO. But his principal contribution, the contribution that we all remember him for, is the fact that he uh, uh, he invented what was then called the village system, and the village system was invented in the late 50s. And now in the UK we talk about home treatment, and and essentially, obviously, he invented it because of necessity. He didn't have enough beds, but he was ingenious enough to recognise that the treating the person in the setting in which they lived on a day-to-day -day basis was far better if you could manage it than admitting, admitting them into a hospital. So, so that is, for me, was one of his major contributions. And second contribution was he was involved in the first properly organized transcultural, cross-cultural study, um, what, which resulted in a, in a major text, which is called the, the Mental the Psychiatric Disorders Amongst the Yorubas, which was a study looking at mental illness in Abelkota in comparison to me mental illness in the United States. So this was a joint Ibadan called University Study, which was published in 1963 and provided the basis for the international pilot study on schizophrenia, which the WHO then set up thereafter. So, so there we have uh, there we have a, a Lambo, who, as I say, is quite quite a major major psychiatric figure, and of course he was uh, he was uh, a foundation fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Now, Chingwe wanted me to say a little bit about uh, contemporary psychiatry, but uh, time just talking about the back, about the past. But I want to mention the fact the the uh, black psychiatrists. Are continuing to make uh, 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 contributions far outside their field. So, so uh, the, the the leading medical school in Nigeria is the University of Ibadan, and as we speak this year, Yinka Omigodun was a woman. She's the first dean of the medical school, and and she's a child psychiatrist. Um, so we can't say that she's first psychiatrist because Lambo was a dean of the medical school. But we want to be uh, pleased that we've got psychiatry taking leadership role within medicine and of course it, it, we need more of that to take place and finally to talk about the future the the future is uh, extremely important and paul reeses and and adrian have talked about how important it is to have a diverse uh, uh, audio, a, a diverse uh, uh, employ, um, employees and a, a diverse body of of, of uh, professionals in the in in anywhere in the world. So so we want to say something about the contribution, the 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 fact that the this association has been set up gives me a sense of confidence because of course I have come practically to the end of my clinical career, but I'm very delighted and very pleased to support Chingwe and others to ensure that we have a mouthpiece, that we have a, a way of influencing policy within the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and not only within the college, but also that we have a way of influencing policy in the country, because there's no good reason why the Association of Black Psychiatrists couldn't be making contact with and trying to influence policymakers in, in Westminster or in Whitehall. And, and our task, one of our most important tasks, is to ensure that many, many, many more young black kids in the UK come to medicine and therefore also come into psychiatry. There are the, the, a lot of the black psychiatrists in the UK have their, their fees, their, their education has been paid for by African governments who hardly have any money. So, so the British government is essentially living off the taxes of African peoples 
Um, uh, uh, but what we want is to ensure that black kids in the UK are also encouraged and they, it's facilitated for them to go into medicine. And then it's our task as psychiatrists to ensure that they choose psychiatry. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Prof. Um, uh, it, it, it was a, it was a, Genius. you've given us food for thought. And um, on, on the back of our, 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 our seniors that had come before us, and um, thank you very much for your support and your encouragement. Um, can I, um, can I ask for for questions? Um, Hal is, uh, is, is standing by to take questions. Um, over to you, Hal. You're sure. mute, Hal. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you, Hal. So, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm just um, being mindful of time now, so I'll just go straight to some of the questions that have been asked. I think the first was directed towards um, Dr. Ladi Smith. And um, um, a member, Akeem, was wondering if there's any data um, relating to um, um, the dropping of high specialist trainees um, out of higher specialist training, um, if there's some anecdote or some explanations to that. So that was directed to you, Dr. Ladi Smith. So I don't know um, anything specifically about uh, um, certainly black doctors dropping out of uh, higher training. Um, I do know that there was um, some evidence about uh, doctors, gen junior doctors generally dropping out of uh, um, training, specialist training that happened after the junior doctor strike and there was a lot of discontent and I think there were concerns then that, that um, a lot of there were t quite a few doctors who weren't continuing and you know once they got onto a rotation they weren't continuing or people choosing not to continue in medicine after they had finished their foundation years so i do know about that but i don't know if there's a significant difference in terms of um ethnicity but um it's, it's an interesting point definitely something we can look into um Thank you, thank you for your response. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if Adrian has any okay. information about that. Uh, I don't have the, uh, the the detail, I'm afraid, but we can certainly get that detail. We'll note it down as a question that we can get what detail that we, um, we, we, do, uh, uh, we do have. What we do know is that uh, way too many of our trainees drop out of training. It's um, it, it was always a, a challenge to uh, to fill our our posts. We've done a great job in now filling 100% core training, but if we then lose a significant number of those, then it's it seems to be sort of doubly bad, really. That um, uh, to 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 have all that sort of commitment, the individual commitment, the person starting their training, you would expect that you would uh, some might decide it's really not for them, or the you know we may sort of say well really that they're not um that their their psychiatry is not going to be for them but uh, that should be a very very small number and at the moment we we lose between about 30 to 40 percent of our trainees which is is just uh, just ridiculous and uh, the, the reason that people uh, leave their the training is because they don't feel valued they don't feel supported quite often it's it's kind of very sort of basic things that people actually just don't get and so we we've got a lot of plans. I think it has improved, uh, but in terms of our workforce wellbeing strategy, a lot of that is aimed at, at trainees and making sure that they're they're supported properly, and that people who have very particular needs and particular need for support that we we address that. Thanks. So I just go to the next question. Um, it's for Adrian. Then I mean, with the low rate of black members in the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Is there a need for a quota system that for, for appointment into committees? That is some protected post for ethnic groups that we need to be at the table. Others can try to help us, but uh, they hardly understand. Well, Hal, thanks for that, uh, that question. 
I, uh, I, I personally uh, am against uh, quotas for uh, in any diverse groups, and uh, I think that it, it, it has to be a, an absolute last resort. And I'm not saying that we wouldn't ever do it, but I think there are much uh, be better way ways of, of doing it if we can, and if we can do it in a reasonably timely way. Uh, I mean, wh why, uh, do, do, why, why don't we, we have uh, sufficient representation? Uh, I guess it's that we, uh, we, we haven't supported people in the way that they, they should have been supported. Uh, I think that, uh, I think Lardy was saying earlier on that, the way the, the way in which you're judged uh, is, I think, that is a, is a very important uh, part of this. Uh, that and some of that's conscious, and some of it's unconscious, and we we really need to do something about that. I think we need special programs to support people. We need visible members of the college who are in the, 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 the most influential positions actually talking about this, encouraging people, uh, you know, saying to people, look, we, we really want you to take up these roles, but I guess people won't take them up unless they they trust the system, unless they feel that actually they're they're not. It's not actually just about the numbers in, in committees. It's when you're there, do you actually have a voice and are mm. you listened and can you make have can you have an influence? So I, I think trust is 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 big on this, and I think uh, you know now we have the Association of Black Psychiatrists. I want to uh, regularly engage uh, with with, um, uh, with with the uh, association, and I hope that people will see that sort of engagement that actually makes a real difference that people will see the the the, the leadership chin way that you you've you've uh, you've shown and will say yeah, we we want to be a part of that but people won't want to do that unless they see i guess that people like you chin way can actually make a a difference that you can actually uh, that something changes so that's a responsibility for me to ensure that 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 happens so i'm personally against uh, uh, quotas, but I think it would be it would be at the end of uh, 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 what what we should do, and I think it's it, it's I think it's kind of a bit of a failure. I mean, it's, it's clearly yeah. but at the moment the the system is failing, and we need to do something about the system. Thanks. So, Pat, so, yeah. Can I just say something about Go that? On. I think it undermines the position of many people if if that's what happens, and people think well, you're only here because you're black. I've had too much of that already and it's not helpful and actually there are better ways to do it we want to do it in in a way that is meaningful so that when people get on committees they're there because they know they're there through merit they know that they're able to make a difference and that they are every bit as good as everyone else who's on that committee and that's in that's absolutely crucial and the good news is we can start to do that now yeah thanks so i'm just looking at the time now um, so it's it's um, five ten and five. There are a few more questions, but we'll, we'll perhaps communicate that through the right channels. Um, so so Chingwei, um I hand over to you at this point in time. Um, thanks for the responses. Thank you, Thank you for that, Hal. Thank you for that, Hal. Yeah. Um, thank you all. Um, you know, I just want to say uh, thank you know a big thank you to our speakers. However, before the closing address, we would like to hold a minute silence for the peaceful young peaceful protesters who were singing the national anthem as they were being shot down by the police. So, if you please join me in a minute silence.
Thank you. Um, just as we come to the end of, of our programme, um, before I invite Dr Udenze to give us the closing address, I want to uh, sort of inform everybody we have a message from Dr Alta Stewart. Um, she has sent words of uh, appreciation and encouragement. And um, as a, the sister organisation in the UK, we look forward to working closely with them. On that note, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Vincent Tudenza uh, to give the closing address. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Chingwe. My name is Dr. Vincent Udenze. I'm a consultant psychiatrist with the Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust. I'm an executive member of the Association of Black Psychiatrists, and I currently hold the head of International Link Office. Um, I know that while Karin was speaking, she did mention the importance of the association linking up with Black Africa, linking up with the communities, and most importantly, being able to give back. And that is what we hope to do. Thank you, Chingwe, for the one minute silence. Thank you for Adrian for showing empathy and identifying with the pain that Nigerians are going through at the moment. These are dark days, but we believe that there is light at the end of the tunnel. We've now come to the end of this inaugural meeting. It is a dream come true. Interestingly, this morning I spoke to a consultant psychologist. I invited her to this meeting and she was quite surprised because she said to me that the Association of Black Psychologists was formed in 1994. So this has been long overdue. There is a saying that to whom much is given, much is expected. Today, the bar has been raised for us all. When I refer to us, I mean the association, its members, and the support structure, including the college. We have heard wise and encouraging words from fantastic, knowledgeable, and reputable speakers. The one thing we know is that black psychiatrists matter. Today, I had hoped to read out a long list of about 500 people and say thank you to them. But Chingwe told me, Vincent, keep quiet, just one minute. So I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and acknowledge some people specifically. First of all, I say thank you to Almighty God for his grace in enabling us in the planning and execution of this event. Most importantly, we also talk about thank the Royal College of Psychiatrists and its structure for your immense support. Adrian James, President of the Royal College, we say thank you. To Paul Rees, we say thank you. Professor Ebody, my mentor, I say, and we all say thank you. Shibalade Smith, we say thank you. And of course, Karen Glover, thank you so, so much. Some people have worked behind the scenes, especially from the college. Elaine Cook, Tracy, Agnes, for working tirelessly. A very big thank you to you. We want to acknowledge the work and input from members of the diaspora committee. We also like to acknowledge two particular organizations that have you know, kind of really helped us out a lot or supported this course. This includes the Nigerian Secretary Association in the UK, and the Association of Black Psychiatrists in the USA. We want to say thank you to Arthur Stewart, the past president of the American Psychiatric Association, for her goodwill message to us. The inaugural meeting attendees in the UK and from different parts of the world, we say thank you to you all. We also want to acknowledge and thank other members of the other professional groups, nurses, psychologists, who have also been invited and have attended this meeting. And of course, other well-wishers who were unable to attend. Last but not the least, the association's working group that have worked tirelessly to put this event together. You know yourself by name, we say a very, very, very big thank you for putting this inaugural meeting together. At this point, we want to bring this meeting to an end. I would like to say that you enjoy the rest of your day God bless and goodbye. Thank you all.
Thank you, Vin.